Now, ischemic heart disease, how do we define ischemic heart disease? What is the basic concept related with the ischemic heart disease, right? First of all, we must know that it is the one of the most important condition a doctor must know. The reason being that ischemic heart disease is presently the number one cause of death, number one cause of death in males and females both in USA and other western countries or industrialized country. Let me repeat it, that ischemic heart disease is the number one cause of death in males and females in USA and other industrialized country, right. And how do we define ischemic heart disease? Ischemic heart disease is a group of clinical pathological syndrome. It is not one condition. There are many syndromes I will discuss into detail that ischemic heart disease is a group of clinical pathological syndrome, group of clinical pathological syndromes, right, which result due to imbalance between oxygen supply and demand to the myocardium. These are clinical pathological problems which result due to imbalance in oxygen supply and demand to the myocardium, right? Usually oxygen supply is less and or oxygen demand is more and there is relative ischemia of the myocardium, right? Due to, again let me repeat it, what is ischemic heart disease? It is a group of clinical pathological conditions in which due to imbalance between oxygen supply and demand to the myocardium, there is relative ischemia of the myocardium, right? So what is the real problem in ischemic heart disease? Look here, problem is that normally in a healthy myocardium, there is a balance in oxygen supply and not only oxygen supply, we can say other nutrient also, oxygen supply and oxygen demand or nutrient demand. Now, this balance should be maintained. Whenever oxygen supply is reduced and or oxygen demand is increased and myocardium develop relative ischemia, we say that there is ischemic heart disease, ischemic heart disease. Right? So, what is this ischemic heart disease? It is a group of clinical pathological conditions characterized by imbalance in between oxygen supply and oxygen demand by the myocardium in which the result is relative ischemia. Is that right? To the myocardium. Now, there are so many conditions in which oxygen supply is reduced and there are other conditions in which oxygen demand to the myocardium is increased. But before we deal this area in detail that what are the causes which lead to reduce oxygen supply, I would like to clear your concept related with concept of ischemia and concept of isolated hypoxemia, isolated hypoxemia. These are two slightly different conditions, both can lead to ischemic heart disease. Let me explain. Let's suppose this is your left ventricle and here is a coronary artery which is supplying the blood. Now, ischemia means there is reduced blood flow. Let's suppose that here is atherosclerotic plaque, there is a fixed obstruction. So naturally when there is atherosclerotic plaque here, the blood flow to distal to this plaque is reduced, right? When perfusion to distal dependent myocardium is reduced, we say there is ischemia and ischemia has three features. Number one, there is reduced oxygen supply, but not only oxygen supply is reduced to the dependent area, but there is also reduced other nutrients which are required by the myocardium. Ischemia has three component. Number one, of course, when blood supply is reduced, there is reduced oxygen supply. Number two, there is reduced other nutrients, right? That other nutrients are also reduced other than oxygen. 
right? And not only other nutrients are reduced, there is one more problem. Yes, what is the third problem in patient with its ischemia or hyperperfusion? There is another serious problem. Again, suppose there is a fixed obstruction here due to atherosclerotic plaque, not only oxygen supply is reduced, but other nutrients like fatty acids and glucose and other important substances which are required by the myocardium for the healthy function, they are also reduced. But there is one more problem with the dependent myocardium. Yes, what is that problem? Please let me know. What is that problem? There is, yes, only very good doctors know answer to this. There is impaired washout of metabolic waste because this is one more function of the blood flow. There is reduced reduced washout of washout of yes metabolic waste metabolic waste right now opposite to that ischemia has three problems if i say a piece of myocardium is under ischemia it means perfusion has been relatively reduced is that right and due to that, not only oxygen is less, but other nutrients are also deficient. Along with that, there is impaired washout of, reduced washout of, you can say, metabolic waste from this area. So, this is a double problem. Oxygen and nutrients reduced and accumulation of waste product, right? So, ischemia is more dangerous than simple hypoxemia. In case of simple hypoxemia, in case of isolated hypoxemia, hypoxemia, what is the real problem in case of isolated hypoxemia? Yes, only oxygen supply is reduced. Only oxygen supply is reduced. But the other nutrients are being supplied to the myocardium well. And removal of the waste metabolites is also okay, right? Due to this reason, now what are the conditions in which there is isolated oxygen deficiency? Of course, there must be some conditions in which uh, blood flow to the myocardium is relatively normal, but the oxygen carried by the myocardium is very, very less. The classical example here we can put is, yes, severe anemia. If some patient has very, very severe anemia, hemoglobin may be only 3 grams per dl, blood flow may be normal. Blood flow may be normal, other nu nutrients coming to the myocardium may be normal, removal of the waste product may be normal, but still oxygen supply is less. Is that right? So, patient will develop in severe cases some of the manifestations of ischemic heart disease, right? Or, yes, severe pulmonary diseases. You know, in severe pulmonary diseases, if blood is not getting oxygenated well, if blood is not getting oxygenated well, then again there is hypoxemia, right? Oxygen carried by the blood is less. In case of anemia, oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is reduced. And in case of severe pulmonary diseases, uh, oxygen carried by the blood is reduced. Is that right? And another condition which is related like this, and that is due to cyanotic heart disease. Cyanotic heart disease. In cyanotic heart disease, for example, when there are shunting of the blood within the heart and right to left shunt are there. So, unoxygenated blood goes to the left side and mixes with the oxygenated blood. Then in arterial tree, oxygenation level of the blood will be reduced. Now look. What I'm saying that this is a piece of myocardium, right? This is a piece of myocardium. Now, this piece of myocardium, if there is some reduced blood flow, it will develop a true ischemia with three problems. Or if, if blood flow is going normal, but either oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is reduced or oxygenation in the blood is reduced, partial pressure of oxygen, right? Then patient will develop only deficiency of oxygen. So, what is the difference between condition number one and con condition number two? Condition number one is more dangerous or condition number two is more dangerous? Yeah, what do you think Rahul? Condition number one is more dangerous or condition number two? Of course, this is more dangerous. That is why when someone has reduced perfusion, his 
uh, he develops more serious ischemic heart disease complications, right? But someone who has isolated hypoxemia, usually this has less deleterious effects, less dangerous effects. So this concept clear, right? That it's not a matter of only oxygen supply. It's a matter of oxygen supply plus other nutrient supply plus matter of waste. removal of waste products. Is that right? So that is why ischemia is more dangerous than the isolated hypoxemia. Am I clear? Now, after developing these two concepts, uh, let come, let's discuss why a piece of myocardium may be ischemic. What could be the reason? Right? What could be the possible mechanisms and reasons and causes of ischemia to a piece of myocardium? We have already discussed that base of the problem is what? Either there is reduced oxygen supply and if there is ischemia of course problem is not only re there is reduced oxygen supply but there is reduced other nutrients plus there is reduced washout of the metabolic waste. And with that it may be coupled with another problem and that is increased oxygen demand. Is that right? Now first we will deal with this wing. What are the conditions which lead to reduced blood flow to the myocardium, right? So let's suppose I draw the left heart here. Okay, tell me one thing that ischemic heart disease more commonly involve the right heart or left heart? Ischemic heart disease more commonly involve left ventricle or right ventricle? Be careful. Every good doctor should answer without thinking. It must be left. Please write. If you read it 30 times and you don't know, it's very bad. Write it down. Spare a full page and then go to the other page. On one full page, only write this thing. Ischemic heart disease, mainly 99% cases involve the left ventricle. Why? Okay, we'll go into causes late. This concept should be very big concept that ischemic heart disease in 98, 99% of the cases mainly involve the left ventricle. Why left ventricle suffer more? Why left ventricle suffer more? There are multiple reasons for that. Number one, left ventricle has thickness of about 1.5 centimeter and right ventricle has thickness of 0.3 to 0.5 centimeter. So this is one thing. The right ventricle has reduced oxygen needs. It is less thick. Left ventricle has increased oxygen needs or blood perfusion needs. This should be very clear. Left ventricle. Why? Because right ventricle is thin. Left ventricle is thick. Then even right ventricle, you know when ventricle is contracting, it squeezes its own capillaries. Look here. Let's suppose this is the left ventricle here and let's suppose here is the right ventricle here. Now listen. There are capillaries in the left ventricle, capillaries in the left ventricle and there is a capillary network in the right ventricle of course. Now left ventricle has to build the pressure from 0 up to 125 millimeter of mercury. And right ventricle has to build the pressure up to maybe 0 to 25 millimeter of mercury. So which ventricle is working more hard? Left. So it means when left ventricle will contract strongly, it will squeeze its own capillaries. And it will squeeze its own capillary network or it will squeeze its own microcirculation very strongly. And right ventricle when it will contract at the peak of contraction, it will squeeze its own microcirculation less severely. Are you understanding? That when both ventricles contract, left ventricle has to generate higher pressure. So there is higher tension produced in the left ventricle wall. And there is less tension produced in the right ventricle wall. So left ventricle uh, muscles, suppose these are the muscles of the left ventricle and this green is the capillary. So naturally, there is more tension produced by the left ventricular muscle. So left ventricle capillaries are squeezed for more strongly. They squeeze so strongly that during systole, no blood flows, practically no blood flows through the left ventricle. 
This is very important concept because all the body tissues are receiving the blood during systole. All the body tissue receive more blood during systole. But left ventricle itself, which is responsible to produce the systolic pressure, squeezes or strangulates its own blood supply. And when it is producing such a high tension in its wall, right, even though it's providing the blood to the all body, it strangulates its own blood supply and makes it very, very, very vulnerable to ischemia. Opposite to that, it strangulates its blood supply less strongly. If it's strangulating its blood supply less strongly, it means right ventricle is going to be ischemic risk less. Is that right? So another reason is that it produces less tension in its wall, less tension in wall, in wall of right ventricle. And there's more tension generated tension generated in left ventricular wall. Now what are the importance of this tension? If there is less tension in the right ventricular wall, it is usually 0 to 25 millimeter of mercury and tension which is generated in left ventricular wall that is 0 to 125 millimeter of mercury. Am I clear to you? Is that right? Now listen, if there is less tension produced in this, there is less work. There is less work. If there is less work, it means it needs less oxygen. Right? When there is less tension in the wall of the right ventricle, right? So this is doing less work, so its oxygen requirements are less. And when we go to the left side, what really happens? Because in the left side, tension generated in the left ventricular wall is more, so there is more work and if there is more work, that will lead to what? More oxygen needs. More oxygen needs. Am I clear? So now look at the very basic thing. Requirement of oxygen on the right side are less. And of requirement of oxygen on the left side are more. At the top, another tragedy. Right side, it squeezes, it squeezes, squeezes, it's on microcirculation, micro circulation with less tension, with less tension, right? So it impedes its own blood flow less. But when we talk about the left side, what really happened? That left ventricle during systole, during systole, it impedes impedes its own, its own microcirculation, microcirculation with more, yes please, with more tension. So it means that during the systole, here there is less oxygen, there is as compared to the left, as compared to the left during systole, right side has more oxygen supply because there is less strangulation of microcirculation. And here there is less oxygen supply. Now you look at the basic formula. The left side has to work, it is thicker side. If it is thick, it needs more oxygen. Number two, it has to build more tension. Again, it needs more oxygen. At the top, it squeezes its blood supply. So, due to squeeze on its own blood supply, that will lead to what type of problem? Reduced blood supply. So, left side has more demand of oxygen as compared to the right side and it impedes its blood supply more than as compared to the right side. So left heart is far more vulnerable to ischemic heart disease as compared to the right side. Rather here is a very important point which you should remember that blood flow through the left ventricle is mainly during diastole. Why? Because when left ventricle relaxes, right? And during the diastole, pressure is about 80 millimeter of mercury in the aorta. You know, during systole, pressure here is 120. And during diastole, it is 80. But during systole, when aortic pressures are high, during systole, when aortic pressures are high, these vessels are too much constricted, microcirculation. So in spite of high pressure in aorta and high perfusion pressure in coronary system, higher filling pressure in coronary system, uh, you can say microcirculation of left is so much squeezed that it cannot really serve the ventricle. That is why 
left ventricle write it down prominently left ventricle receives its blood supply only during diastole diastole but right ventricle receives blood supply during diastole as well as systole because systolic pressure in aorta is really very high and still during systole and diastole both right ventricle can get some blood but left ventricle needs more oxygen but unfortunately it impedes the circulation more effectively and due to that reason left ventricle is more vulnerable to ischemic heart disease that is why in 98-99% of the cases when we are talking about ischemic heart disease we are talking about the myocardium of the left ventricle only 1-2% to of cases right ventricular ischemia may occur especially when there is right ventricular hypertrophy for example in core pulmonary in pulmonary hypertension when right ventricle become really very much hypertrophied then it also depends uh, develops the risk for ischemic heart disease usually ischemia to the right ventricle occurs when right ventricle is hypertrophied and usually it occurs when blood flow through right coronary artery is reduced because right coronary artery supplies the right ventricle right so this is the basic thing that now next time if someone asks you that when we are talking about ischemic heart disease it more often involve left ventricle or right ventricle what will be your answer it is left ventricle right <laughs> now i will discuss that what are the conditions right which can lead to reduced blood flow to ventricle let's suppose here is your coronary artery ostium and this is coronary artery which is supplying the ventricular tissue is that right this is coronary artery with its branches now i will draw this artery in a big way here and we'll see how the blood flow through this can be reduced and how the oxygen supply within this can be reduced so i will draw it outside let's suppose this is coronary artery ostium and this is yes now you imagine this is a big coronary artery area which we have removed from the heart this is coronary vessel now we have to see this is supplying the myocardium all around it has myocardium we have to see what can go wrong with this coronary artery and blood supply to the myocardium can be reduced is that right first of all we'll talk about the most important cause most important cause is atherosclerosis in the coronary artery atheroma formation in coronary artery you know atheroma is what atheroma is fibro fatty plaque formed in intima is that right so in the intima of coronary artery fibro fatty fatty plaque may be made right and these plaques are called atheromas and this disease is called atherosclerosis this is the most important and most common cause of ischemic heart disease the other causes also i will discuss them of course now what really happens number one atheroma may be a simple look here this is an okay here let's suppose in the intima this is fibro fatty accumulation this is the atheroma now truly speaking you know the structure of atheroma that it should have of course dysfunctional endothelium on it endothelium which is at the top of the atheroma is disturbed so it has dysfunctional endothelium on it number one number two it is having a fibrous cap and this fibrous cap right this fibrous cap consists of smooth muscles right this fibrous cap consists of yes please smooth muscles right and with these smooth muscles yes what else it has it has a lot of collagen right this is the collagen this is the fibrous cap smooth muscles some macrophages may also be there and some collagen is there right now this is a fibrous cap under this there are foam cells foam cells are just large some smooth muscles which have eaten up lot of 
lot of lipids. This is a typical athroma I am drawing. So these are the smooth muscles and macrophages which are present in this area and the smooth muscles and macrophages have engulfed lot of lipids. And this is lipid core inside, extracellular lipid and connective tissue. And here is some neovascularization, new vessels develop at the shoulder of the plaque. Now this is a typical plaque, does that right? Sometimes what happens in some patients, plaques keep on growing over years and years and years and years. In coronary artery, five, the precursor lesions like fatty dots and fatty streaks, they start forming very early, around the 10 year of age. And almost all adolescents have some fatty streaks in their coronary arteries. Is that right? But clinically, they become, they start manifesting the problem in the age of 40 and plus, usually. Now, this is plaque. One way the problem will start, then this plaque will keep on growing, right? And this they will offer an obstruction to the blood flow. And if these plaques are offering an obstruction to the blood flow, such plaques are called stable because they are not rupturing, they are not fissuring, these are not undergoing any complication. We say these plaques are stable, but they are offering a fixed obstruction to the flow. Why I call it fixed obstruction? Because when there is arterial dilatation, can this point of the plaque can dilate which is fibrotic? No. So we could say that usually this plaque may be a stable, uncomplicated, stable athromatous plaque. And this athromatous, stable athromatous plaque is acting as a fixed obstruction. Fixed obstruction. Is that right? Now, this fixed obstruction is at early stages does not produce ischemia. Fixed obstruction does not produce ischemia in the beginning. When it starts producing ischemia, to produce ischemia, it has to block the lumen up to 70%. If up to more than 70% luminal obstruction, luminal obstruction is there right it will lead to look for example if one person coronary artery is almost 70 percent obstructed and 30 percent blood flow is going this 30 percent blood or 25 percent blood which is moving through this unobstructed area is enough to meet the requirement of myocardium during rest so this person will not develop ischemia during rest ischemia will develop only during increased demand so Ischemia will develop, usually this is anginal pain, right? So ischemia will be there, ischemia and its related syndrome are only during, yes, increased demand of oxygen. When oxygen demand is increased, when person is having tachycardia, is that right? When person is having hypertension. For example, our person is exerting. Let's suppose this person who has more than about 70% of the luminal obstruction, this person who has 70% of the luminal obstruction, if you go upstairs, normally what happens? When you do some physical exercise, for example, you go upstairs or you walk or some other physical exertion, what really happens? Heart needs more oxygen. Heart has to work more, right? Cardiac output will increase during exertion. If cardiac output will increase, it means ventricular myocardium has to work more. If ventricular myocardium has to work more, what does it mean? It will produce vasodilators in healthy heart and coronary vessels will dilate to provide extra blood. But a person who has obstruction like this, can he dilate this point? No. So when he will do exertion, increased demand will not be met by this 30% unobstructed area and person will develop relative ischemia and this ischemia may clinically manifest as angina. Is that right? We will talk about later in detail what is angina but what I am saying ischemic, ischemic problem will develop whenever this person has increased demand right but during the rest phase he may not have any problem but if someone has obstruction about 90 percent luminal obstruction 
it's a fixed obstruction. If someone has up to 90% of the vessel caliber obstructed, then what will happen? He will develop ischemia even during rest. Ischemia even during rest. Right? So about the fix, fixed obstruction, you must remember two points. That there is a stable plaque and it is progressively becoming more and more fibrotic and it is progressively becoming larger over the years and years and years. Usually patient will develop symptomatic problem when more than 70% of the lumen is blocked. Around that time person will develop ischemic problems when heart demands more oxygen. For example, during emotional crisis, you know adrenaline is released, heart races up and you need more oxygen or during exertion. But if this obstruction comes near around 90%, then even patient during the rest may feel what problem? Ischemia. And he may develop chest pain. Is that right? Is it clear? Now, so some patient have ischemic heart disease due to stable atheromatous plaque in the coronary which are acting as fixed obstruction. Now I will talk about more dangerous situation in which obstruction is not fixed. Fixed obstruction may convert into dynamic obstruction. Fixed obstruction may convert into dynamic obstruction. And these are the people you have to be very careful of. Later on I will tell you this fixed obstruction is a hallmark lien of typical angina. Because the definition of typical angina is that angina like symptom occur with exertion or angina like symptoms develop when there is tachycardia or when after the meal, right? We will talk about that in detail. So in classical angina or in typical angina or in stable angina, the underlying lien is, yes please, stable lions. Is that right? Now, this was stable plaque, stable plaque. Now we will talk about stable plaque leading to yes fixed obstruction now we'll go to the one next step fixed obstruction sometimes it happen that in some patient plaque is not stable plaque is not stable what really happens there look for example again this is another plaque okay even if it may not be as much obstructing this is a very wrong concept among the doctors, you know. Some young doctors think if stenosis is more, it is more dangerous plaque. But research has told even the plaques which are moderately obstructive may be very, very dangerous. Because these plaques may be having a composition like they have less fibrous, less and thin fibrous cap. Right? And this type of plaque undergo dynamic changes and dangerous changes rapidly. These plaques are not stable. So this is a wrong concept. Doctors and young students think that if plaque is producing 80% obstruction, it is very dangerous. Actually, some plaques which are producing only 40% obstruction can be very dangerous because they undergo dynamic alteration. Now let me tell you how they can undergo dynamic alteration. Look, one thing is, First of all, let me tell you which plaques are not stable. The plaques which have lot of extracellular fat, number one. Number two, we can say dangerous plaques. You make a heading dangerous plaques or vulnerable plaques, right? Plaques not to be trusted, trusted at all, right? This plaque can be trusted to some degree. This cannot be. Why? The reason being it has a lot of extracellular matrix, it has a lot of foam cells, look here, it has a lot of foam cells but fibrous cap is very thin, fibrous cap is, fibrous cap is very thin, this is one problem. Number two, it has more foam cells. Number three, it has more macrophages, it has more, these are the naughty, happy but making trouble for us, what are these? Yes macrophages the plaques with more lipid plaques with more foam cells and plaques with more macrophages 
are highly unstable plaques right and these plaques are vulnerable to severe disruptions these plaques are vulnerable to severe disruption let's compare the plaque number one with the plaque number two the plaque number one has a very thick fibrous cap it has a very thin fibrous cap it has less what is this foam cells it has more foam cells it has less macrophages this has more macrophages is that right and this is having less fat and that is having more fat right so what is really happening that this type of plaque is vulnerable plaque vulnerable to what vulnerable to disruptions it's a vulnerable plaque vulnerable plaque mean vulnerable to what to disruptions acute disruptions it may undergo at any time never to be trusted acute disruptions is that right now what type of acute disruption can occur there right what kind of acute disruptions can be there number one plaque may undergo i will make this plaque here plaque may undergo fissuring okay simple thing erosions and ulcerations plaque may undergo erosions or ulcerations or more dangerous complication is that it may be disrupted so much that it may undergo fissuring fissuring and rupture now let me tell you what is the difference in these two group of problem erosion and ulceration are a different problem fissuring and rupture is more dangerous problem let me tell you exactly you know this is the basement membrane and over this what is this this is endothelium which is dysfunctional and this is the normal endothelium now and this is the let's suppose lipid material is that right if endothelium is damaged and removed from here an underlying thrombogenic basement membrane is exposed then it is erosion or ulceration if endothelium is shaved off removed of course there is no razor there it is removed right and if endothelium is lost from here an underlying basement membrane of entima is exposed is that right and this basement membrane is highly thrombogenic right it will attract the platelets and platelets will start sticking over there platelet will develop adhesions we will talk about this platelet problem later but it is thrombogenic exposure of subendothelial collagen of the basement membrane then it is erosion and ulceration but if problem becomes so severe that damage goes deeper and this is sub what is exposed now highly thrombogenic intra plaque lipid material when within the plaque lipid like material is exposed is the right to the blood this is called fissuring if it is very narrow or if a big area then it is called rupture is that right so it means one thing will be common in fissuring and rupture that whenever fissuring and rupture is there the problem has gone beyond the basement membrane and even underlying what is exposed the fat yeah fat cholesterol material and other intra this area so if again let me repeat this is endothelium which is dysfunctional if only dysfunctional endothelium is lost this is erosion then ulcerations and if with the endothelium basement membrane is also lost and even this material is exposed then it is fissuring and rupture but both conditions are something common in both conditions platelets will stick on that is that right and when platelet will stick what will happen let me tell you let's suppose this is the area this is exposed now these are the platelets which will stick and when platelet are sticking to this exposed area we call there's a platelet adhesion reaction reaction number one is yes what is happening to this platelet platelet are becoming 
adherent. Should I make a larger diagram so that you can understand? Okay, platelet adhesion. When platelets stick to non-platelet surface, this is called platelet adhesion. When platelets stick to non-platelet surface, this is called platelet adhesion. Already endothelium was dysfunctional. Dysfunctional endothelium of the plaque does not produce nitric oxide. It means it does not repel the platelet. And now, what really happens, platelet will stick, after platelet stick over here, these platelet will start releasing, these platelet which are sticking there, they will start releasing, yes please, can you tell me what will they release? They will release more platelet aggregating factor, they will release ADH, which will call more platelet. They will release 5 hydroxytryptamine they will release, yes, epinephrine, they will release pro-coagulant -co substances, pro-coagulant, some of the coagulation factors and they will expose and not release but expose, uh, you can say platelet factor 3 and 4 which help in coagulation. Now look, when platelets stick to non-platelet surface, they undergo, what is this reaction? Adhesion reaction and adhesion will lead to release reaction. Release reaction will produce the product which will attract more platelet, which will attract more platelet. Then next line of platelet will undergo release reaction and more platelet will come. Now platelet are sticking to the platelet. When platelet stick to the platelet, this is called platelet aggregation. Please focus here. That when this first layer of platelet, this one, this first layer of platelet stick to the non-platelet surface and this layer is showing adhesion. But second and third layer are sticking with the platelet where platelets stick with each other, the term used is platelet aggregation. So it means wherever there is erosion or ulcerations or whenever there are fissioning or rupture, there will be platelet adhesion, platelet release reaction, platelet aggregation and eventually a platelet aggregate will be formed. What is this? platelet aggregate will be formed. So it means that this vulnerable plaque may undergo what type of complications? This vulnerable plaque may undergo, yes, erosions and ulceration or they may undergo fissuring and rupture, right? These are two group of complications or disruptions in this. And after this disruption, one more problem occurs. There is, in addition to that, there is platelet, platelet adhesion, release reaction and aggregation. So platelet plug, platelet aggregate is formed, aggregate is formed. Do you think it's a good development or bad development? Bad development. Now the stable plug is totally unstable. Now the stable plug is becoming what type of plug? Disrupted plug and this acute change in the plug or disruption in the plug that has led to Erosions or ulcerations or fissuring or rupture that is leading to platelet adhesion and release reaction and platelet aggregate formation. Is that right? Some people develop only platelet aggregation and some unfortunate people. The tissue factors are released and at the top of platelet aggregate, what is this process? College, what is deposited? Fibrin is deposited and fibrin deposition result from what? process of coagulation. Now let me tell you, there is a difference in platelet aggregation and there is difference in coagulation. Many people confuse that. Let's settle it once forever. Platelet aggregation means platelets stick to each other and make a small mass. This is platelet aggregation. And let's define coagulation. Write it down. Coagulation is conversion of, coagulation process is the conversion of soluble fibrinogen, soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. You must be knowing coagulation cascade, is that right? Intrinsic pathway of coagulation and extrinsic pathway of coagulation, all those pathways in the end have common thing. What is the common? That all coagulation pathway in the end convert the insoluble fibrinogen, sorry, soluble fibrinogen. They convert the blood soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin strands, right? And when these fibrin strands deposit on the platelet plug, we say now coagulation has occurred 
at the top of platelet plug. So it's a two different thing. One is platelet plug, other is coagulation. So in some patients, there's only platelet plug formation. And in some unfortunate patient, at the top of the platelet plug, there's deposition of fibrin. And we say at the top of platelet plug, there's coagulation process also. And when platelet plus uh, platelet plug plus coagulation, both things are there, we call this situation thrombus. When both of them are there, we call it thrombus. So what we'll write here? That there may be thrombo thrombus as well. Thrombus as well. Right now, look at these dynamic changes. Now look at these dynamic changes which kill so many people. You see, you see in USA every year how many people suffered with myocardial infarction? 1.5 million people every year suffer with myocardial infarction. And Half million of them every year die. Half million people die due to such things. So you must know as a good doctor what really, really happened at cellular level, molecular level and plaque level and vascular level, which really kills the patient. So commonly, you know, in the world, every minute one person die with myocardial infarction. Every minute. Not one, rather lot more than one. Right? So again, let's come back. <coughs> So what is happening? I told you that plaque may be stable, atheromatous plaque may be classified as stable plaque or these may be plaque with acute changes, acute changes or we call it acute disruptions and of course Abdul like the word of dynamic that it has become a dynamic plaque and dynamic plaque is like a dynamatic plaque. It's like a dynamate. It will really kill many of the patients. Right? Why this dynamic plaque which is undergoing acute changes? What are the acute changes? We have already discussed. Yes. First there was erosions and ulceration. Other group was yes, fissuring and yes, rupture. Right? There is another acute change I did not discuss. I think it's worth discussing. Another acute change is that sometimes the vessels at the margin of the plaque, I told you there are new vessels formation at the margin of plaque. These new vessels, why these are forming? These new vessels are formed because platelets are releasing growth factors, smooth muscles are releasing growth factors. Uh, macrophages in the plaque are releasing growth factor, endothelial cells are releasing growth factor. So all the cellular player in the plaque are releasing growth factors and these growth factors lead to growth of the endothelial tubes from small vasa vasuri. And these endothelial tubes which grow towards the plaque is a very bad news. These endothelial tubes are not well supported by collagen. These are not mature blood vessels. This neo neovascularization is a very weak vascularization. With little irritation they, or with little stress, these vessels can rupture. And if these vessels rupture, they will lead to what? Intraplaque hemorrhage. They will lead to intraplaque hemorrhage. And plaque will simply balloon up. Do you think it's a happy news? This is one balloon you should be afraid of. Is that right? That sometimes in the plaque there is intraplaque hemorrhage. And when intraplaque hemorrhage occurs, plaque simply, atheromatous plaque simply swell up. And when it will swell up, it may produce severe acute obstruction of the coronary artery. Is that right? Now, <laughs> why intraplaque hemorrhage occur? Please write it here. There is one more complication and you should not forget intra Yes, plaque hemorrhage. Do you, this is also acute change. You never know at what time in your life one of the plaque in coronary artery undergo hemorrhage. And if a plaque undergoes hemorrhage, it's a very, very bad news. So, what are the bad news here? Erosions and ulcerations, fissures and ruptures, and intraplaque hemorrhages. These are the three group of acute changes in the plaque. Right? Now, erosions and 
erosions and fissures they can lead to platelet plug at the top platelet plug or if person is really unfortunate there may be or full thrombus formation thrombus formation and it will these two platelet plug formation or thrombus formation will dynamically obstruct the lumen very rapidly is that right they will rapidly reduce the lumen size secondly why we call them dynamic changes look here why we call them dynamic changes why because when platelets are binding there they may be less platelet there may be more platelet is that right sometimes in the beginning they are less with the time they become more or if you have given some fibrinolytic drug or antiplatelet drug maybe thrombus or the platelet may wash away is that right so when you can give listen why we call them dynamic changes because these are not stable either they spontaneously change platelet plug may form and disperse or they even thrombus sometimes in some lucky guys even thrombus may go into thrombolytic process naturally is that right so this is dynamic change or in some unfortunate platelet plug may convert into thrombus and thrombus grow more and more and become occlusive thrombus is that right or thrombus may detach and may lead to embolization it is quite possible this thrombus which has been made here look here this was a thrombus right okay let me draw it this is the thrombus this is quite possible this thrombus may detach and may go to smaller vessel and block it here very happy to it has traveled something but it may produce severe problem right this thrombus so it is a dynamic changes which are occurring that platelet plug may form and dynamically obstruct plate thrombus form dynamically obstruct or it become truly dynamic that it become detached embolize and this thromboembolism may block some other dis distal part of the artery is that right and then of course intra plaque hemorrhage is also dynamic do you think a plaque which has hemorrhage inside it it is stable plaque no it is dynamically ballooning up another point to remember that dynamic uh, intra plaque hemorrhage may be from within the plaque or sometimes after some fissuring some fissuring here blood may enter from this area and if blood is entering from this area intra plaque hemorrhage is occurring from the luminal side so intra plaque hemorrhage may occur within the plaque or blood may seep from the luminal fissure into that under both condition it is good or bad it's very bad another point which i would love to highlight is that what is the point in the plaque where the plaque ruptures most often which is the point where the plaque ruptures most often first of all it's worth repeating which plaques are vulnerable which plaques are vulnerable plaques which are with moderate obstruction plaques with thin cap plaques with more fat lipid and plaque with more foam cells and plaque with more macrophages because macrophages produce metalloproteinases which digest away the fibrous material and make the plaque weak and make the plaque more susceptible to hemodynamic stresses these are the intrinsic factor related with the plaque the structure of plaque is more vulnerable now question is that which part of the plaque is most vulnerable of course not the cap at the edge of the cap so easy to understand you need common sense you know here is the plaque with the cap right now cap is th thinnest this is the cap of the plaque now you tell me that this cap is thinnest at the margin at the ends or it is thinnest at the middle margin so the in atherosclerotic plaque most often they rupture where the cap is meeting the normal arterial wall there are two reasons for this number 1 there's minimum fibrous tissue here this is the weakest point of the plaque at the top usually macrophages are entering from this point and these macrophages may be producing metalloproteinases and digesting away at the top most shear hemodynamic stress is also here 
and blood is moving like this and hit this obstruction, it will love to avulse it from here. So next time if someone asked you that what is the point in the plaque which is most vulnerable to rupture, you say most vulnerable point is the junction of the plaque with the normal arterial side. It does not usually rupture from the middle, it ruptures from the ends where the plaque edges are meeting with the normal arterial wall. Why it is happening so? Because there the fibrous cap is very very thin and macrophage activity is more. And here I should give you some good news. You know there are lipid lowering drugs, statins, they are wonderful drugs, statins. And put a tick mark with them. The one thing which every good doctor knows, other thing only few good doctors know. The thing which everyone knows is the statins reduce the cholesterol level. Everyone knows, there is no fun in telling you people, you are so intelligent. Everyone knows that statin reduce what? Cholesterol. cholesterol level. And of course, when statin are reducing the cholesterol level, cholesterol entering in the plaques is less. Then foam cells are less, so plaque becomes stable. I told you the plaque will become more vulnerable when they have more lipid and more foam cells. And if you are taking statin, if you are giving your patient statins regularly, when his cholesterol levels are low, then cholesterol supply to the plaque is also low. And if there is less cholesterol coming to the plaque, then it is very natural to understand that intraplaque lipid will be less and of course intraplaque foam cells will be also less. This is what every doctor knows, but only very good doctors know. Statins drug have anti-inflammatory action on the plaque, write it down. Statin drugs have anti-inflammatory action on the plaque. What does it mean? That if statins can inhibit the inflammatory activity in the plaque, plaque will become more stable or less stable? More, more stable. They will be less inflamed because inflammation in the plaque make the plaque very vulnerable. Is that right? So statins are wonderful drug, not only they reduce the lipid and, and help in stability of the plaque, but they also inhibit the inflammatory process in the plaques and when macrophages in the plaque become less, metalloproteinases and other destructive enzymes become less, then fibrous cap is less destroyed and plaque will become more stable. Even this claim now that not only statin, statins, not only reduce the progression of plaque, but now they believe that proper use of statin can even regress some of the plaques. Proper use of statins can even, I will teach you these things in detail in pharmacology. For a while you just trust me, I am right. That statins are so wonderful drug that not only they stabilize the plaque, not only they reduce the further progression of the plaque, rather they can, yes. Regress the plaque also. It's a very good news for those people uh, who really know that they are in trouble. And by the way, look, we can talk later, but this is right now. It came to my mind and it's again uh, should be written with the golden words. You know, platelets make the plaque very dynamic. When platelets stick, plaque, plaque will grow dynamically and it may remain platelet plug or may convert into thrombus. Is that right? You know one of the very powerful factor which increases the chances of platelets to stick to the disrupted plaque, one of the very important factor which, may, which make the platelet, which favor the platelet to stick to the, un, uh, to the disrupted plaque is smoking. So it's good smoke? No, tobacco smoking is one of the major factor which favors the sticking of platelet with the plaque. So if you smoke more, platelets have more chance they will stick to the disrupted plaque and you have more chances to develop more severe ischemic heart.